and that created the Special Operations Command. That law listed 12 core mission areas for the command and gave SOCOM some unique authorities. It's certainly appropriate, it seems to me, for Congress to review its handiwork, especially as we look back now at a decade of fighting terrorists, a decade in which SOCOM has roughly doubled in personnel, tripled in budget, and quadrupled in overseas deployments. We may not be able to quantify as precisely the achievements of these last 10 years, but they are, in my opinion at least, undeniable. Looking back on the past decade, my strongest impression is of the incredibly talented, committed, hardworking individuals who serve our country in SOCOM units. As I traveled to Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere, I'm continually impressed and inspired by them, just as I know other members of this subcommittee are. The capability that these people, with their training, their hardware, and their supporting organizations, bring to our country is without parallel anywhere in the world. Some of that capability was on display to the world in the Osama bin Laden raid. But SOCOM does much more, often with little or no fanfare, as it should be. It may well be that the future of the command will require greater emphasis on some of those other mission areas, such as unconventional warfare and foreign internal defense. Of course, we consider the future of SOCOM and our entire military within the constraints of tight budgets. But it seems to me it would be the height of foolishness to provide insufficient resources to an entity charged with fighting terrorists, preventing weapons of mass destruction from being used, and training other nations to defend themselves so that we don't have to. The first job of the federal government is to defend the nation, and SOCOM is truly the tip of the spear that does that. We are honored to have Admiral McRaven in his first testimony before this subcommittee since assuming his new position as uh, SOCOM commander, and appreciate Assist Assistant Secretary Lumpkin, himself a former SEAL, for being here today as well. Before turning to our witnesses, I'd yield to the distinguished gentleman from Rhode Island, ranking member, for any comments he'd like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for convening this hearing. Secretary Lumpkin and Admiral Craven, welcome, and uh, thank you very much for being here today. I look forward to your testimony. The importance of SOF in today's fight, while so often in the shadows, as the Chairman pointed out, was brought into the spotlight during the daring raid into Abbottabad back in May. All of us in this room, and in fact the nation, owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to the men and women who serve with you in SOCOM. Raids such as the one which killed Osama bin Laden highlight the wisdom and the prescience of the authors of the Goldwater-Nichols legislation. Today, joint operations between the services are commonplace and expected, uh, and we have seen an unprecedented rise in both the capability of our special operations forces and the prominence they play in our modern military. It wasn't that long ago that SOF was looked upon as a sort of boutique force, one which with, a, uh, with niche uh, capabilities that performed important but lesser activities around the edges of a primary conventional force effort. And because of the results of their efforts, uh, we are often known only to a few uh, with the right clearances or keen-eyed observers. Some even questioned whether we needed SOF at all. Well, 10 years after 9-11, and due in no small part to our experience fighting al-Qaeda and its affiliates in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, they uh, are the stuff task forces are built around, oftentimes augmented uh, by conventional forces and, and a very central component of our ongoing fights in the Middle East uh, and elsewhere. Those legislators who had the vision to create SOCOM could not have envisioned exactly how SOF would evolve in the 25 years that followed, but they knew they had to create a framework that would enable success whichever requi way requirements pulled the force. That remains our task today. Now, I am not uh, suggesting that we need another massive piece of legislation. But we do need to think about whether the way we are currently training, manning, and equipping our staff today is sufficient and appropriate for the future. We must utilize the lessons learned from the past 10 years of warfare and ask tough questions. Have our soft forces withstood the, the last decade? I should say, how have our soft forces withstood the last decade? What factors, both uh, internal and external, helped and hurt their growth and efficiency? Uh, as the defense budgets tightened in coming years, uh, where must soft grow? 
in which areas have uh, the, uh, the experiences uh, that have yet to be explored. Uh, the timing of this hearing couldn't be better, Mr. Chairman, and we have to consider how best to posture our forces for the future security challenges and contend with the, the prospect of austere resources. I hope we, uh, we see a, a wide-ranging and robust discussion today about lessons learned and uh, thoughts about uh, what is to come. Uh, are the acquisition authorities agile enough while still properly tailored to yield the specialized equipment you need when you need it without duplicating other efforts and costs uh, uh, elsewhere in the greater DOD budget? Um, will the rest of the force benefit from your acquisition efforts as appropriate? Can we train your people properly? Are the authorities governing your operations crafted so that uh, you can uh, do what you need to do, yet still be subject to appropriate control uh, and oversight? And how have the lines blurred between Title 10 and Title 50 affected the force? And most importantly, uh, are you able to stay true to your core, to the soft truths which all operators know and understand in spite of the current operational and fiscal realities? These are the questions that we uh, hope to explore today. And uh, uh, the Secretary and Admiral, thank you both for your great service to our nation. Uh, we are deeply in uh, your debt and to those uh, uh, who serve under you. And I look forward to your discussion and your, your testimony here today. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for convening this hearing. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, now we will turn to our witnesses. Mr. Michael D. Lumpkin, Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations, Low Intensity Conflict, and Admiral William McRaven, Commander, U.S. Special Operations Command. Mr. Lumpkin and, and Admiral, without objection, your full statements will be made part of the record. And please feel free to summarize them and make such comments as you see fit. Mr. Lumpkin. and members of the committee. Thank you for the invitation to be here today. As we approach the 25th anniversary of the founding of United States Special Operations Command and the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low-Intensity Conflict, I want to acknowledge the unique relationship we have had with the Congress and this committee. Your support and that of the American people for our Special Operations Forces was essential in the creation of SOCOM and SOLIC and continues to be the key enablers for us today. As we reflect on the lessons learned of the past decade, it is crucial that we put, forward, put them into a broader context. In 1970, American Special Operations Forces carried out one of the most daring raids in American military history. The attempted rescue of 61 American prisoners of war suspected of being held in North Vietnamese prison camp at San Tai, a mere 40 miles west of Hanoi. Only 10 years later, in 1980, our Special Operations Forces attempted to rescue 55 American hostages held in Iran. That operation failed, resulting in the death of eight service members and damaging American prestige worldwide, principally due to a decrease in operational capabilities. Thirty-one years after the tragedy at Desert One, our Special Operations Forces have come full circle. The daring and successful raid at Abbottabad, approximately 40 miles north of Islamabad, led to the death of Osama bin Laden showcases the superb skills of special operators today. As we enter an era of constrained defense budgets, we must not repeat the mistakes that led to the de degraded soft capabilities throughout the 1970s. Our goal must be to retain and, in fact, hone all of our soft capabilities so that our nation will have them in full measure in the decades to come. We must retain and sharpen our proven direct action capability, the tip of the spear, so to speak which is what most Americans think of when they hear special operations. But this is only one aspect of what SOFT does. There are less obvious but equally important SOFT capabilities for indirect activities that enable us to persistently engage throughout the world, working with international partners to build their capabilities before conflicts arise so that they can defend themselves and, by extension, defend us. Our experiences have validated the five SOFT truths. First. Humans are more important than hardware. SOF is successful because we equip the man, not man the equipment. It is all about our people. This leads us to the second soft truth. SOF are unique, are uniquely able to provide a nation with targeted and precision capabilities across the full spectrum of conflict, whether it is training partner military units, counting terrorist threats, or conducting high-end direct action missions. Our return on investment in, is the highest among all U.S. forces. The third and fourth soft truths are interconnected. Soft cannot be mass produced, 
and competent SOF cannot be created after emergencies occur. It has taken the last decade to grow our SOF capability from approximately 33,000 service members to almost 58,000 today. As we increase the number of SOF, we must ensure a commensurate growth in our enablers. This takes us to the fifth SOF truth. Most special operations require non-SOF support, including support from general purpose forces and the interagency. We know that the team approach in DOD in the interagency and with international partners carries the day. Another key lesson over the past decade relates to the old adage that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. For a relatively small cost, we are able to build partner forces and, access to, and gain access to better local intelligence, which can create security without requiring a large, expensive U.S. footprint. In the foreseeable future, disrupting, dismantling, and defeating al-Qaeda, its adherents and associated movements will continue to dominate the SOLIC and SOCOM agendas. Supporting SOCOM's efforts to refine counter-network tar targeting, interagency collaboration, and organizational structures will remain a priority. SOLIC will continue to, to be the focal point for coordinating DOD's role in the national strategic counterterrorism activities. Post-2014, DOD is projecting a baseline requirement of 10,500 to 12,500 deployed special operators on any given day. SOF represents an exceptional value to our nation, consuming just 1.6 percent of the defense budget and comprising less than 3 percent of U.S. military personnel. The characteristics of our special operation warriors guarantee that our military possesses a capability for facing the unknown threats of the future and general purpose forces downsize. On behalf of everyone who serves in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations Low Intensity Conflict, I thank you for your longstanding support of our Special Operations soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, and the thousands of civilians that support them. This concludes my opening remarks, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Admiral? Good morning. Uh, Chairman Thornberry, Ranking Member Langevin, and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, again, thank you for the invitation to appear before this committee and the opportunity to represent the men and women of the United States Special Operations Command. I'm honored to command such a capable and effective organization and privileged to appear today alongside my teammate, Secretary Michael Lumpkin, the Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low-Intensity Conflict. I've uh, positioned a few posters around the room which highlight SOCOM's rich history, our authorities, those legislated by Congress, and those directed by the President and the Secretary of Defense. How Special Operations has changed since 9-11, where we are today, and how we are preparing for tomorrow. As you know, SOCOM was legislatively created by Congress in 1986. Congress's vision and support, coupled with tremendous military leaders and exceedingly talented operators, have created the most, special most capable special operations force the world has ever seen. I applaud lawmakers' foresight in legislating this command into existence. You can be very proud of the results. U.S. SOCOM is one of nine unified combatant commands across the Department of Defense. And while similar in many regards, we are unique in that we also exercise numerous service, military department, and defense agency-like responsibilities. Among SOCOM's legislative responsibility is to prepare special operations forces to carry out assigned missions, including training and equipping the force, and to command select special operations missions when directed to do so by the President or the Secretary of Defense. Additionally, U.S. SOCOM is directed by the Unified Command Plan to synchronize planning for global operations against terrorist networks. In carrying out these tasks, we work closely with the Secretary of Defense, the Joint Staff, the Geographic Combatant Commands, and appropriate government agencies. These authorities have effectively prepared and equipped our force to meet the threats of the last decade and to be postured appropriately for future challenges. Since 9-11, our force has doubled in size, our budget has tripled, and our deployment requirements have quadrupled. However, congressional support has enabled U.S. SOCOM to continue providing rapid global options to meet a broad set of complex and dynamic challenges. Special Operations Forces currently serve in both supporting and supported roles across the battlefield. With an annual budget of $10.5 billion, U.S. SOCOM comprises only 1.6 percent of the Department of Defense's proposed FY12 budget and put simply, provides a tremendous return on the nation's investment. Our success in these roles hinges on the application 
of the indirect and the direct approaches, meaning that both approaches are required to achieve the desired results. The direct approach is characterized by precision, highly kinetic strike forces enabled by technology, and linked through a digitally networked battlefield. Since 9-11, these largely kinetic counterterrorism operations have had great effect disrupting Al-Qaeda and its affiliates by providing space and time for the indirect approach to achieve its desired effect. Conversely, the indirect approach is focused on advising, assisting, and training our global partners. Our persistent presence is enabled by a deep understanding of the local culture and context. These two approaches are mutually supportive and necessary elements of effective special operations employment. Currently, more than 13,000 members of Special Operations Command are deployed globally, with 85% of those forces deployed to the Central Command Area of Responsibility. Of these deployed forces, more than 10,000 SOF are in Afghanistan and Iraq. The other 3,000 Special Operations Forces are deployed to more than 75 countries around the world. Operating at the invitation of the country and the approval of the ambassador, these forces are performing non-combat missions in diverse, challenging environments. The goal of these forces deployed outside combat is to build partner nation capacity. Building this capacity is critical to enabling our partners to deal with their own security challenges, strengthening their regional stability, and decreasing the man demand for U.S. support. As many of you know, our total force faces challenges as well. With a significantly increased operational tempo and continued high demand for Special Operations Forces, the past decade of continuous combat has resulted in increased pressure on our forces and families. While SOF and their families are resilient by nature, the effects of 10 years of focused combat operation convinced my predecessor, Admiral Eric Olson, to form a task force to examine what he described as the fraying around the edges of the force. Over a period of several months, the task force conducted over 400 focus group discussions with more than 7,000 Special Operations Service members and more than 1,000 spouses from 55 different SOF units around the world, including forces deployed in combat. For SOF, there is no single cause responsible for the frame. It is the accumulation of a multitude of stresses spread throughout the training and deployment cycle. While I can assure you the state of Special Operations Forces is strong, the pressure on our service members and their families requires careful attention to ensure the long-term health of the force. Compounding the stress on the force is the reality that the demand for SOF continues to exceed supply. As we draw down the general purpose forces in Iraq and contemplate drawdown in Afghanistan, SOF will likely be the last force to experience relief. As Admiral Mullen said earlier this year, SOF are typically the first force in and the last to leave. With 85% of deployed SOF in the CENTCOM area of responsibility, the pent-up demand across the other geographic combatant commands continues to grow, and I do not anticipate it to decrease. Another challenge for SOF is our reliance on the general purpose forces for supporting infrastructure and enablers. SOF, by design, depends heavily on the service-provided capability for support. Consequently, as we look at the drawdown in Afghanistan, the potential drawdown in Afghanistan, and the potential for additional SOF requirements, we need to make sure the appropriate infrastructure and enablers remain in place to make SOF as effective as possible on that battlefield. Globally, Special Operations Forces are contributing well beyond their numbers and are known for their high return on investment. In the future, I see great benefit in developing a global SOF network. We're working through the geographic combatant commands and bolstered by our ties with the interagency and our allied SOF partners, we can react even more rapidly and effectively against our enemies. My number one priority is winning the current fight while maintaining the health of the force. But close behind that priority is expanding this global soft and interagency network to deal with future challenges. I'd like to conclude with two final points. First, I believe the Special Operations Forces have never been more valuable to our nation and to our allies around the world than it is today. And the demand will not diminish for the foreseeable future. Second and lastly, I want you, I want you to know how proud I am to command the greatest Special Operations Force in the world. And you have my promise that we will continue to fight as long and as hard as you need us to in order to protect this great nation and the principles we hold so dear. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Admiral. And uh, I, sus I don't believe any member of this subcommittee has any doubt about that, and that is reassuring. Uh, let me ask uh, for y'all's brief comments on a couple of issues within the time I have uh, available. One is back to the statute. 
as I mentioned, the statute lays out 12 specific areas for Special Operations Command. If you look through some of uh, through them, it seems to me it's a huge breadth of our security challenges right now, from foreign internal defense, terrorism, counterterrorism, uh, you know, the, the whole list. Are there any of them that you would recommend Congress at least examine? to see whether there should be changes, either additions or subtractions, to that list of 12 that were put in, uh, in, in the original bill? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, as we look at uh, the le missions that were legislated within the Goldwater's Nickel, um, what we do is we have the codified process of the Quadrennial Defense Review where we go through these, uh, all of these missions and we scrub them to make sure that we indeed are doing what needs to be done for our nation. So we have, the process works very well. What we have identified in, the, for example, the 2006 QDR was that the, the missions were largely w what we needed it to be, but we didn't have the force size to accomplish them completely. So the QDR 2006 was the program growth of SOF itself, of the operators. In 2010, we saw the shortfall of the uh, enablers to allow SOF to do that, to execute their missions. Um, so we saw that programmed in the growth across um, the fight up, and that's the program that we're executing right now. So I think our missions are accurate and effective for what our nation needs, uh, but I'll defer to Admiral McRaven. Well, sir, I would agree with uh, Secretary Lumpkin. I, the great thing about it is a lot of those missions are mutually supporting. So if you are training a special forces officer and NCO and how to do counterinsurgency, that same skill set can apply to foreign internal defense. Uh, if you're training uh, an operator in how to do counterterrorism, a lot of those same skill sets will apply to countering the proliferation of the weapons of mass destruction. So the great thing is when we look at those uh, mission sets that we have, again, I think if you focus on kind of the direct and the indirect approach and we train all of our operators to do both, uh, the mission set, as uh, Secretary Lumpkin said, I think is uh, exactly what we need now and for the future. Okay. Uh, second issue I'd invite you all's comments on is budget. Um, under some scenarios, there could be reductions to every account in the defense budget, as I understand the, the way that uh, potential sequestration would, would operate. Um, I, I also understand from reading the press that the, the Department of Defense has put out some restrictions on how uh, military officers can talk about consequences of defense budget cuts, and I certainly am not asking you to violate any orders that you've received, but uh, I would appreciate, I think we all need to hear somewhat about uh, the potential for 5 10 percent budget cuts to uh, SOCOM's budget. Within the department, as you're aware, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, we are doing a strategy-based review as far as the, the budget reductions to make sure that we have a holistic um, look of what the requirements are of the nation uh, and to make sure we have a forces that are prepared to respond to those uh, future um, situations globally. So we, we are looking and we're within the department to, to, to find out where we can find those efficiencies. Uh, the key that we are really looking at, not only within the soft portfolio, but it also with the, the enablers, as the services look at reductions that may impact them, they have a direct impact on us for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, that is where we draw a lar large portion of our forces from. They come into the general purpose forces and then we will transition to soft at some point. So we have them, them as a talent pool, first of all. Number two is, is that they provide the support that we need. Um, to execute our mission so we can focus on those specifically and don't well, while we do have the need for organic combat support and combat service support, we do rely on heavily on the general purpose forces. So we're looking very closely to see what the budget impacts are going to have on them, which will in turn influence and impact us. Sir, sure, I'd just echo those comments. Uh, I think uh, within OSD, within the Department of Defense, they understand the value that SOF brings to the current fight. And, uh, and the future fight. Uh, our real concern, as Secretary Lumpkin said, is the impact on the services and, and as the services have to potentially cut uh, key enablers, that is going to affect us and we just have to make sure that we are in constant dialogue with the services, which we are through this whole process. Okay. Just be in constant dialogue with us, too, uh, because uh, I am concerned about uh, where this 
could, could lead. And the idea that some people might have that, oh, we can keep the counterterrorism effort going, we'll just cut the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. They don't, this enabler issue that you brought up, I think, is, it may not be apparent to most people. Gentleman from Rhode Island. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, Mr. Secretary and uh, Admiral, thank you for your testimony here today and your service. Um, given my roles on both the House Armed Services Committee and the House Intelligence Committee and the ability to have transparencies uh, into both Title X and, and Title 50 uh, responsibilities, I, I wanted to focus on that area a bit uh, this morning. Um, you know, I am increasingly aware and, and, and to a degree just concerned that uh, the lines between those two uh, authorities are becoming blurred as they relate to uh, military soft capabilities. Ten years ago, uh, the 9-11 Commission, for example, recommended uh, that uh, responsibility for paramilitary operations should be shifted from the CIA to U.S. Special Operations uh, Command. Uh, this recommendation was primarily based on the belief that the CIA doesn't have a robust capability for, the, for conducting these types of activities. Uh, but with an over, over a decade uh, of warfare uh, experience now under its belt, uh, I, I certainly believe it goes without, without saying that the CIA's capability uh, has grown uh, tremendously uh, in this area, without uh, delving too much into de without delving into classified information, and we'll talk more about this in a classified setting uh, later. I I'd like to hear your your thoughts on the following: Has the Title uh, Ten Title Fifty divide taxed your force significantly? Uh, do you agree with the 9/11 Commission that the U.S. military should take on uh, this traditionally agency-led role? And uh, and the third question in this area: How can Congress uh, best bridge the uh, Title X, Title 50 divide uh, and provide the necessary oversight uh, in this uh, somewhat gray area. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, do you want to start? Um, thank you for the question, sir. Uh, we can go more in depth, of course, in the, in the closed session after this. Uh, I would submit that the 1050 um, divide that you speak of, we have a very good relationship with the interagency. Uh, we have uh, the processes and, and um, memorandums in terms of reference in place to effectively um, ensure that we within uh, so, uh, Office of Secretary of Defense and uh, Special Operations have oversight over any activities that go on between uh, U.S. Special Operations Command and the interagency uh, in that realm. Uh, I don't believe that this is a mission at this point that should be um, migrate to DOD because the relationship is very good and it maximizes and gives us the ability to, to work through the different authorities that each agency has. And uh, I, the, the rest of it I would prefer to defer to the closed session if possible, sir. Fair enough. Do you, let me ask this, and I think we can probably ask this, I can ask this in an open session. Are the, is the agency properly resourced to do the missions that it's uh, it's called upon to do, uh, or is it uh, the type of thing where they're they're stressed and uh, it's it's more of a uh, an area where soft forces would be more capable? We have I have not run into a situation yet where they were resource deprived um, to execute a mission that that was uniquely theirs that we could not help them with. When they find that they are and there's a shortage, we can work something. Um, through that, to, to bridging the gap to make sure they have the capabilities that are necessary. Okay. Admiral, do you get a comment? Sir, I'm not sure there's much to add, uh, but I will tell you that the relationship between CIA and Special Operations Forces is as good as I have ever seen it. Uh, both uh, under Director Panetta and now, of course, under Director Petraeus, I think we're going to see that uh, relationship continue to strengthen and, uh, and blossom. And again, great relationship. I think we clearly understand on the Department of Defense side uh, the lanes in the road in terms of Title 10 versus Title 50. And as Secretary Lumpkin said, I think we can certainly address some of your uh, other concerns in the closed session. Fair enough. Uh, let me talk, turn to uh, budgets in the time that I have left. Mr. Secretary, in light of the, the budget debate here in Washington and the inevitable shrinking of the defense budget, I, I'm concerned about the effects of this squeeze on uh, the soft community, as, uh, as is the Chairman. Um, during our brief meeting yesterday, uh, you, you had mentioned concerns about the effects of ongoing DOD budget uh, efficiency efforts on SOCOM and the various forces uh, who would uh, enable SOF to do uh, their mission uh, so well. Can you elaborate on those concerns and, uh, more specifically and uh, which enablers are, are, are absolutely vital? And uh, are there any areas where 
uh, some flexibility exists in those uh, enabling forces. Thank you, sir. The principal concern that is what goes back to the issue of enablers, to making sure that those are in place to support our SOF. As we see the general purpose uh, force footprint reduce specifically in Afghanistan in the future, we understand there's going to be a, a higher reliance on the special operations community. So we are watching and to see how those uh, reductions will impact SOF. ISR in particular um, is one thing that we rely heavily upon. And so we have to make sure that we watch to see what, how that looks and how that goes to, to make sure we fully recognize the impact on our special operations community. So again, it goes back to, to largely to the enablers. I think our nation uh, understands the benefit of SOF, uh, especially in the environment that we anticipate in the future uh, globally. So I, I think that uh, we need to uh, work with the services, uh, make sure that we're, we're uh, focused and uh, adaptive to, to what happens in the future uh, as we look at the budgets in the coming uh, years. Very good. Thank you both for your testimony. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Hunter. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first question, Admiral, is you talked about pent up demand. I'm, I'm assuming you mean Central America, South America, Philippines. Can you expound on that a little bit? Yes, sir. Um, as uh, I mentioned in my opening statements, we've got about 85 percent of our special operations forces currently in the CENTCOM area of operation. And frankly, I think uh, at this time and place, that's probably the right percentage to have there. But clearly, there remains demand uh, in other theaters uh, that uh, over the course of the last 10 years, we have had to draw from some of the other theaters in order to support uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So as we look at the future uh, and the potential, uh, well, the drawdown in Iraq and obviously uh, over time the drawdown in Afghanistan, certainly what I will try to do is balance those requirements that are coming from the geographic combatant commands uh, in the various theaters so that we can better support them. But right now a lot of our lift, a lot of our personnel uh, have come from those theaters in order to support the, uh, the effort in CENTCOM. So when you look out the next say even 10 to 20 years and how and and how soft's going to need to transition whether it's being more in like southeast asia right. what do you see as the most important thing that because you have you have people like chairman thornberry chairman langevin they've, they've been here for a long time they've they've seen administrations come and go they've, they've been here prior to 9 11 and afterwards so what's what's next looking forward <coughs> that we need to make sure that we don't take our eye off the ball, as those of us that are here longer through multiple administrations, through multiple changes, multiple wars. What do we need to keep focused on over the, the long term? Yes, sir. You know, our, our strength, I think, is this uh, global soft network that I talked a little bit about in the, uh, in the opening comments. Uh, we work through the theater special operations commands in order to influence and support the geographic combatant commanders. So as I look at the future of the U.S. Special Operations Command, one of the areas where I intend to put a lot of emphasis is building up the Theater Special Operations Command so that they have uh, the entire uh, spectrum of capability that I think they'll need for the future. Now, every Theater Special Operations Command will be a little different. Uh, clearly, as we look at some place like uh, PACOM and SOC PAC, can they use ISR, for example, unmanned uh, ISR? And the answer is, I think, in certain cases, they absolutely could. For uh, disaster relief. Uh, if a tsunami hits someplace, somebody may want to understand what the, what the problem looks like. So ISR is probably applicable uh, in, in SOCPAC as well as SOC South. But as you look at a place like SOC Ur, uh, I'm sure our ability to fly into European airspace with unmanned aerial vehicles is probably a non-starter. So we're going to have to balance out what comes out of Afghanistan, as you point out, in the next, uh, you know, uh, whatever that timeline looks like, five, ten years, take that, uh, those resources and then again balance them out across the, the various theater socks. But I, I uh, believe that our future, SOCOM's future, lies in the theater special operations forces and making sure that they are robust enough to handle the problems in their particular geographic areas. Going back to en enablers again, if you talk conventional Navy, which is your primary enabler internationally, not right now in Iraq and Afghanistan, but primarily after these uh, we draw down, do you think that they're set up in a way right now? Would you change anything in big Navy, conventional Navy, and the ships that they're buying in, in the way that they're going towards un unmanned vehicles, 
um, in their m movement, I guess, trying to get involved right now in these two wars and be somehow involved in these two wars and have a, 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 a role to play. Would you change their, their direction, or do you think that they are doing enough to enable you in the future when we start moving out of Iraq and Afghanistan? If I may, uh, Mr. Hunter, is we are working closely with the Navy as far as when it comes to their, their structure, especially in the realm of uh, maritime ISR, to support SOF and to make sure that they have a, a capability that can meet our needs globally, uh, that is uh, especially in the expeditionary na uh, nature of the Navy as we move forward and sometimes frequently with sh short or little notice that if they are already in place, they can support our forces um, through um, uh, that maritime ISR. So that is one of the key things that we are working with the Navy in particular on. What about shipbuilding? You, are you guys happy with the uh, littoral combat ship and its capability? I haven't, uh, can, candidly, I haven't had those discussions with, with, with the Navy. Um, as we look at it, a, a more robust capability is always better for us that, that, that's out there. Um, but uh, I'd like to take that one for the record, if that's okay with you, sure. sir. Yeah. So, you. so SOF, just to make sure, SOF has not looked at then the LCS as, a, as, a, uh, as one of their prime, primary vehicles for the future, especially the Navy SEALs? No, we've we've looked, definitely the I know the force has looked at the the LCS and, and the Navy um, capability at large. Uh, I, I'm not I don't have the answer to that question right now. I'd like to take it for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Secretary Lumpkin and Admiral McRaven. Thank you both for being here. I especially want to welcome a fellow San Diegan as well, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Uh, I think one of the things that's become really clear is that our SOF members have become really the experts in the whole of government approach. And I wonder if you could, could share with us, I guess, um, is there something that we really can take from your experience, from the SOF's experience, into the military as a whole uh, as we train and prepare uh, uh, individuals on, on all of, all of the, across the services? And, uh, and also, um, whether, in fact, um, we, we uh, are, are able to, I guess, send a, a clear message that working with our international partners, that it, it, it takes, it, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's still, as we deal with SOF, it's still the military. And yet we talk about the whole of government as being something perhaps different or, and added value to the military. Now, how do you... Work that uh, in the field, particularly as we as we go into many areas where we're trying to prevent those conflicts. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, and I, I'm glad you asked the question. Frankly, um, from my previous command tour as the commander of JSOC, I can tell you that not a single mission that we conducted did not have a heavy interagency flavor to it, uh, and we learned very early on that uh, what the interagency brought in terms of diversity of their cultures. Uh, and their unique capabilities was a huge enabler for Special Operations Forces, particularly the kinetic side. So if you're going to go against a target, uh, you're going to have intelligence support from CIA, NSA, DIA. Uh, you will have uh, support uh, from NGA on the graphics, uh, everybody, and of course State Department, a key player in all of this, uh, FBI as we are supporting certain missions that the FBI may be conducting. So. Uh, tremendous interagency lash-up between special operations and our interagency partners. On the indirect side, I would say it's very much the same. Uh, those forces out in the field are working with USAID, they are working with NGOs, uh, again, trying to build host nation capacity. If they are in a non-combat area, uh, they are sitting at the table uh, with the country teams to make sure that the country team mission, that they are in support of that. So. Uh, interagency is is really kind of a foundation of how we are doing special operations today. Is there something unique about the way you've been able to break down those barriers, and perhaps we've had more difficulty in other areas? I, I think a lot of it has to do with it. At the end of the day, there are results in terms of if an interagency supports an operation in Afghanistan with intelligence uh, or graphics uh, or uh, authorities they will see a result of their support to special operations. And that, that tangible result really makes a difference in how much they want to provide support. 
And you see that again downrange as well. I think if you would talk to ambassadors across the 75 countries in which we are in kind of day in, day out, they will tell you that the, uh, the support provided by the military information support teams, the civil affairs teams, and then the joint training that happens with the special forces and the SEALs uh, is tremendous to support U.S. policy. Uh, so they see immediate results when they invest in special operations. And, uh, and I think that's what brings us together. Mm -hmm. Is there something in particular we, though, could, could generalize to training um, among our, our forces? I know we've done cultural training. What is it that, that should, should be included more, that should be a higher priority, perhaps, than what we have today? In terms of special operations or the conventional forces? Conventional forces. Yes, ma'am. I think the conventional forces are also embracing the interagency. I can tell you from my time in Afghanistan, uh, you saw uh, a, a little bit of what we had developed at the Joint Special Operations Command in Afghanistan with uh, all the way down to the brigade combat teams and to the battalions that were on the ground. They knew that the interagency support, the, in, the intelligence community, uh, along with the other supporting agencies, uh, were a tremendous resource uh, that, that they could use. And again, they got results. Uh, so. I think the conventional force gets it. It's just that we're dealing with a larger scale in the conventional force, mm -hmm. whereas the smaller scale of, of SOCOM and Special Operations Forces allows us to turn that information more quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. If, if I can make an editorial comment, I would greatly admire Ms. Davis's relentless pursuit of making sure that the federal government can use all the tools available to it as effectively as possible. And I appreciate your answers on how the good things that are happening in the theater, but uh, th in my opinion, we have a ways to go in this government uh, to, to, to really be effective with all the tools we have and to break down those barriers that, uh, that, that still exist. Mr. Conaway. Uh, preach on, Mr. Chairman. Preach on. Uh, Admiral, uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you for your service. <coughs> um, Admiral Craven, you walked us through a little bit excuse me, of the uh, things that you're doing and, and uh, that Admiral Olson started <coughs> with respect to making sure that uh, the folks we asked to do the most, um, and quite frankly, we probably ask them to do more than we should have, but we'll continue to ask them because they'll stand in and make it happen, that they and their families are... Um, as uh, treated, uh, well, not treated well, but is, uh, have the tools and, and uh, resources they need to do whatever it is <clears throat> that, that must be done so that the next time we ask them to go do something, they're ready to do it. And then when they come back from that, that they go back to being able to, to, being able to live as a, as, a, as, a, you know, as a family man and, a, and, and take care of their families. Are there things that, um, that, are, that you would like to do uh, or things you'd like to have done that you can't do at this point? point in time because of you need authorities or something? I assume that the things you, you can do, you're doing, but is there anything out there that needs to be done that, uh, that this group needs to be aware of? Sir, I think we have all the authorities we need, and I think that we have the resources we need. I think, frankly, it's a function of focusing our resources. The pressure on the force task force that Admiral Olson uh, started uh, just recently kind of reported out, and I have gotten the recommendations from that task force. And in fact, I'm sitting down with my staff at U.S. SOCOM to figure out how we're going to implement those recommendations. Uh, some, some of them, I think, are, are well within uh, our ability to implement, and some of them are just the, uh, the nature of the fight that we're in. As, you know, as long as we're continuing to fight, there is going to be stress in the force. What I, think I, have, what I know I have an obligation to do as the commander of SOCOM is to make sure that we are making uh, the, the predictability factor uh, as good as we can make it. And by that, when you talk to most of the families, they will tell you that if they can get more predictability in their spouse's deployment cycle, then, then they can begin to plan things. And they may understand that their spouse will be gone on Christmas or on Easter or another holiday. Uh, but, and, and if they can plan for that, they're kind of okay with it. But it is the unpredictability that drives a lot of them, uh, that drives a lot of the stressors, I think, around the families. And I think we can certainly... Uh, deal with that issue and deal with it well. Uh, the other piece is education. They want to understand uh, the effects of TBI and PTSD, and so there's an education piece that I think we've got to broaden uh, the aperture a little bit with our families. Well, I, I'm sure everybody on this committee, as well as the broader full committee, would be uh, keenly interested in tracking or watching 
uh, those kinds of things that you do uh, as a result of the report that the, uh, the task force uh, uh, put in place. The, one of the tools that you have to have is uh, language skills. Um, how are you dealing with the, the, the demand for language skills in a, in a, in a, when you're having folks at the operational tempo that you've got them at? Um, uh, talk to you a little bit about what the focus is there. Uh, sir, we've got a, a magnificent uh, language program at, uh, at Fort Bragg that the U.S. Army Special Operations Command uh, runs. And, uh, and every special operations officer and NCO at some point in time in his career is expected to, to get a, uh, a language uh, baseline. Uh, so we're continuing to invest a lot of money in language because, uh, as I pointed out in my opening uh, comments, I mean, it is about us being uh, culturally aware. And I don't think you can become culturally aware of a society until you can understand their language. Uh, I think that's a big part of it, at least. So we're putting a lot of investment in it. And I, I think that is, uh, I know that's going to pay huge dividends for us in the future. Uh, it is certainly one of my top priorities. Well, in the time I've got left, uh, General Clapper made an interesting comment the other day in conversation in the Intel spaces about uh, not everything that the Intel community does is of equal value. And I don't need an answer this morning, but one of the things that kind of following on the chairman's questions about those 12 things that we've asked you to do is um, an honest, straightforward analysis at some point in time that if there are things that you can offload, not that they're less, they're not super important, but things that you can offload uh, to other places or that we simply as a, as a team don't need to do, um, that, that's something that I think collectively the entire system ought to be thinking about and looking at as we look at shrinking resources or resources that stay flat, how do we uh, manage that? And one of them has to be a, uh, an opportunity to say this is something that we did in the past, you asked us to do in the past, and we don't think that's necessary, and, and having an honest conversation. Your tendency, I seem to hear from all of the folks in uniform, is that whatever it is you ask to do, that's uh, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, and we'll go do it. That, there, there ought to be an opportunity for us at some point to have a rational conversation around that issue that uh, there's just some things that you don't need to do or don't need to be done, and, and we'll need to have that conversation. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Gibson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank the panelists uh, for being here today. Uh, to, to a degree, I think we're all products of our own experience. Uh, I'm no different. Uh, on this subject, uh, I'm informed by my experiences as uh, G3 for Multinational Division North during the surge. Uh, a lot of debate as to uh, what uh, may have gone into why the atmosphere, the environment in Iraq changed over time. I, I think it's really a combination of things. I think, yes, the Sunni awakening had a part of it. Uh, there's no question the surge also played a part because uh, it was important to have security on the ground to allow uh, all the Iraqis to, uh, to give some thought as to what kind of future they wanted to have. But then also very important, uh, the role that the Joint Special Operations Task Force uh, played uh, in terms of uh, killing, capturing high-value individuals. Uh, I saw on a daily basis just the uh, remarkable integration of intel and operations for effective action. And uh, very keenly interested in seeing us uh, raise that level uh, of play and focus at the national level. I I'm aware of, uh, to some degree, of global pursuit and some of the actions uh, and studies that have done in the past. And I'm trying to bring that spirit to uh, what we're doing nationally in terms of policy. Uh, so in the Intel Authorization Bill, got an amendment that looks at um, consolidating the Intel community to better fuse it with operations. And I wanted to make you aware that uh, with the chairman and the ranking members' help, uh, we did put in the mark. Um, something you alluded to earlier, Admiral, uh, and that is uh, the 1986 law that created SOCOM. And uh, I'm of the mind that we should revisit that and take a look at, are there changes, restructuring within the headquarters that may allow us to more effectively fuse intel and ops and to really neutralize uh, this threat, uh, even helping us uh, work in concert with uh, friends and allies as you bring this to a, to a finer point and to a higher priority. And so uh, I guess I wanted to make you aware of that, if you, if you weren't aware, that I've had conversations uh, with your predecessor about this, uh, particularly frustrated with the Christmas Day bomber uh, and the fact that uh, that radicalized young youth's dad called our country and we, weren't, we didn't have the agility to process that information. And, 
you know, had we had the same facility as we had in Iraq at the operational and tactical level, I think at the national level, uh, we would have been in a better position to address that threat. So um, I just want you to know I'm going to be supportive going forward uh, to your efforts and certainly welcome your, uh, your dialogue at this point uh, on, on these comments. Well, sir, first, uh, thank you very much, and I, I certainly appreciate uh, your interest in those efforts because we think they are exceedingly important. And, and as you know from your time in Iraq, we took those lessons learned. You know, how do you fuse ops and intel? And we migrated that over to Afghanistan. And I would contend that uh, the reason the Special Operations Forces on the kinetic side have been so successful in Afghanistan is because of the fusion of that ops and intel. Uh, having said that, I will tell you that I think our greatest success in Afghanistan has come uh, from the Special Forces officers and NCOs who have been on the ground trying to change the landscape, if you will, uh, in terms of our relationships with the Afghans. Uh, the village stability operations, uh, developing the Afghan local police, uh, this is, I think, the most promising effort we have in, uh, in Afghanistan right now. And the fusion of the ops intel piece, as you know, uh, much like Iraq, you know, we're not going to be able to kind of kill our way to victory in Afghanistan. We've always understood that. Every, every soldier understands that you can't do that in a counterinsurgency. Uh, so the effort that we're putting into supporting uh, the VSO and the ALP, I think, is going to be critical. The real question is how do we take that concept of fusing ops and intel, get it down to the, the uh, ALP level, the village stability operations level, and ensure that those young uh, SF officers and NCOs and SEALs that are out there doing this have got the same sort of situational awareness that we have kind of on the kinetic side. Uh, it's a different requirement. Uh, the kinetic side, frankly, is a lot easier uh, than understanding the, the human uh, landscape out there uh, in, the, uh, in the districts and the provinces. Uh, without question, uh, tremendous integration of the indirect and direct approach there. And in particular, I just wanted to, as we close here uh, with my time, um, that uh, your predecessor had some ideas on how we may be able to reorganize the headquarters there so that we could elevate the priority, the, the very successful actions that are happening in the central command area of uh, responsibility so that we recognize we face a global threat here uh, and, it's, uh, and in protecting our cherished way of life, uh, we're, we're going to, I think, have to step it up a little bit. Uh, and really, it's us in the Congress, I think, that, that can be helpful to you because uh, every day the Herculean efforts that, uh, that are done uh, throughout your command, uh, there may be ways that we can organize uh, more effectively. Thank you. I'll yield back, Chairman. I thank the gentleman, and I appreciate, Admiral, your comments on the village stability operations. Members of this subcommittee have been in Afghanistan walking in some of those villages and are uh, also incredibly impressed at the progress being made through that effort. And, and uh, as you say, it's a complicated, different sort of mission, but, but incredibly promising. Mr. Franks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, it can never be said often enough uh, how much uh, those of us on this committee appreciate all of you. Um, it is easy to, to say that Mr. Lumpkin, Mr. Or Admiral McRaven, and those of you that are attending them, it's easy to say you're the best of the best. Uh, everyone knows that. But oftentimes I think it, it's uh, something we overlook that uh, those of you in this position don't, uh, aren't motivated for glory, but you're, you're, you're committed to, to fight because you love what's behind you, not because you hate what's in front of you. And uh, we just want you to know this committee appreciates that very deeply. And uh, some of the recent uh, discussions on the budget may not reflect that. Uh, and uh, so I, I don't want to ask the, the wrong question here. I know that uh, those of you in the, in the military and in the uniform always handle some of the most awkward questions so well. Uh, you, uh, you, sometimes you get asked the most stupid questions on the planet and you come back with great decorum and answer them like they were coming from the deepest intellect possible and I'm, I'm grateful. Um, but uh, as, at a time when um, there are, as you put it, Mr. Lumpkin, to, you know, special uh, forces warriors spending more time in a year in a, in a deployed or training uh, posture than at home, uh, you know, they're there are those of us that are very concerned about the budget hollowing out our forces and doing things that put uh, enormous pressures on all of you. Uh, so I guess I, I guess I have to ask a little bit of a question that you can't possibly answer, and that is, do you feel forgotten by Congress? Do you feel Congress doesn't care? 
Absolutely not. <laughs> he had no, to say the, it the, that way, didn't he? Yeah. No, the, the Congress has been very, especially this committee, very supportive of uh, U.S. Special Operations Command and, and my office to make sure that we are resourced, whether it was through QDR, uh, the different QDRs, 06 and 10, to build us a force that can meet the needs of the future. The key is we have to stay and continue that growth that's already programmed to make sure that we're there for the nation in the future. Well, I can tell you there's, there are a lot of us that are deeply committed to that. But when you talk about fraying around the edges, there is a conviction on our parts, many of us, that uh, part of that uh, rests with Congress. And we, we want to make sure that you have the resources and, the, and the, everything that you need. Uh, so let me just ask a, a general two-part question to both of you. Uh, and I'll probably take the rest of my time for you to answer. Um, if you had any area that you could point to as your front line uh, in in your agencies, in your in the special forces, the, the things that you rep think represent the greatest challenge that you have, can you elaborate on that a little bit? And also, can you say to this committee, uh, if you were able to to speak as candidly as possible, what would be the greatest need that you have? What would be the greatest? Um, not request, but uh, admonition that you might make toward this committee as to what we might do, whether it's in the area of funding or, or the, the focus of that funding or in the area of policy. What, what is it that you need most from us uh, to do the, the tremendous job that you do? And Mr. Lumpkin, I'll start with you and then hope Admiral Craven, you, McCraven, you'll follow up. Uh, thank you, sir, and, and I'll be brief here, is that uh, as we look at the fiscal challenges that we, we face, is that uh, the sequester in particular would be very problematic for us because... Problematic, it, that's it, a nice way to put it. it, it yeah. Is that it, it doesn't allow us to be strategic. Yeah. Uh, so in order to, to make sure we don't go down that road would be very helpful to us and, and the nation as a whole. And, and the greatest need, frankly, is to stay on the current program growth that we've got um, as, as we're moving forward, because that, uh, that will get us where we need to be as a nation mm -hmm. and to make sure that uh, our SOF is properly resourced. Sir, if I can add to that, I, I think our greatest uh, challenge in SOF right now is that we're in great demand, and that, that's a good place to be, um, but obviously that demand is, in fact, taxing uh, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and civilians that support SOCOM. Um, I would tell you that the greatest need is to continue to have uh, uh, great Americans and congressional delegations come down range and continue to show the soldiers their support. Uh, I have probably done hundreds of congressional delegations that have come to visit me in Iraq and Afghanistan, and every one of them sends a signal to those young soldiers that America cares. So it is vitally important, I think, for the Congress to continue to come down range, to see what's going on, to have an understanding of what the needs of the soldiers are, and then come back here and be able to put that into play. Uh, but, but I can tell you as a commander, I always welcome the congressional delegations and the staff dels, uh, and I think you should continue that to show support for the effort. Well, thank you both. Thank you all for your noble service. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Um, let me ask about uh, a, a specific authority. There has been talk, Admiral, about uh, having the, your position have greater influence on personnel management issues. And, and as you know, there's been a proposal to change one of the words in Title 10 where it would give you change from monitoring to coordinating. The idea would be to kind of strengthen the hand you have in, in personnel management. Now, as I understand it, DOD has, has put out kind of a new directive, but to date, only the Navy has reached an agreement on how to implement that. Uh, so it, it, it comes back to my mind saying, well, maybe we need to take another look at the law if the other services are not able to work with SOCOM uh, to, to have some sort of arrangement on, on how the personnel issues will fit together. Tell me where we are and, and shouldn't we look at that issue? Sir, as you know, I've been in command about five weeks now, and, uh, but I can tell you from my discussions with Admiral Olson, this was clearly a concern of his. Uh, having said that, I, I think the relationships between Admiral Olson and the service chiefs was very strong. And he made a point on a very routine basis to sit down with the service chiefs 